Are you past the point of weary? Is your burden weighing heavy? Is it all too much to carry? Let me tell you about my Jesus. Do you feel that empty feeling? Cause shame's done all it's stealing. And you're desperate for some healing. Let me tell you about my Jesus. on everybody.
something he is up to something god is doing something right now he is up to something he is up to something god is doing something right now he is healing someone he is saving someone god is doing something right now he is healing someone working this morning all the places that we can't see it all the third world countries all the families that we can't see what God's doing he's working he's up to something he's up to something and when we're praying God come turn this around we need to be saying God here I am I'm your vessel flow through me flow through me God so we're going to sing this again declare it he is up to something. Come on. He is up to something. He is up to something. God is doing something. Right now. He is up to something. He is up to something. God is doing something. Right now. He is healing someone. He is saving someone. God is doing something. You're right now.
God, turn it around. Oh, God, turn it around. God, turn it around. God, turn it around. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Hebrews 13, 15 says, by him or through him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise. Watch this. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks unto his name. Let's do that this morning. We just declare that we know that God's working even in places that we can't see it. So let's thank him for it this morning. Amen. All my words fall short I've got nothing new How could I express All my gratitude I could sing these songs As I often do but every song must end, and you never do. So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again. Cause all that I have is a hallelujah. Except for a heart singing hallelujah, hallelujah. I've got one response. I've got just one move. Come on, here we go.
So if you have your Bible, we're going to be in Revelation chapter 2 as we continue our study of the churches of the book of the Revelation, which I'm so grateful that today we were able to show that video because it's going to come into play with regards to the church that we're talking about, the church of Thyatira. <clears throat> this letter to the church of Thyatira is is sent to them by Jesus Christ Himself. He sent it by His servant John directly to this church at this point in time in the province of Asia, the Roman province. It's the longest letter that Jesus wrote of all the churches. He had a lot to say in it. Of course, we cannot, we don't have the time to go verse by verse in it, but we are going to expound and elaborate on that which we feel like the Spirit of God has given to us and to help us to understand that once we start down the road of compromise like we talked about with the church of Pergamos last week, you will eventually find yourself completely corrupted. That compromise leads to corruption and this church, Thyatira, was known as a corrupt church. A church that was filled with the ways of the world. And in which Jesus had probably some of the harshest words to say. It's hard for us to make peace with the idea that we have in our mind of Jesus and reconcile them with the words that we see here. But nevertheless, He said it. So before we get started, let us pray. Father, in Jesus' name, 
we've come now to humble ourselves before the truth of this word. God, my opinion and the, the opinions of men and the opinions of other pastors and denominations are irrelevant. They have no weight. All that matters and all authority rests in the truth of your words that are spoken and written. And to those words we humbly bow. God, let us hear what your spirit is saying to the churches. In Jesus' name, <clears throat> amen. Verse 18, and to the angel of the church of Thyatira write, These things says the Son of God who has his eyes, who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and to eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sick bed, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of their deeds. I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and the hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your works. Now to you I say, and to the rest in Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say, I will put on you no other burden, but hold fast what you have till I come. And he who overcomes and keeps my works, until the end to him I will give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron, and they shall be dashed to pieces like a potter's vessel. I also have received, as I also have received from my Father, and I will give him the morning star, he who has ears to hear, let him hear <clears throat> what the Spirit says to the churches. It's the longest letter. Thyatira was, of all the other churches and cities, the smallest, most insignificant city. Uh, it was not rich. It was not famous. It was not known for this. It was not known for that. They did worship the sun god Apollo there. But it was a blue-collar town. And it was filled with guilds, G-U-I-L-D-S, what we would call today labor unions. If you were someone who worked with metal, they had a labor union for that. If, they, if you were someone who uh, was into music or whatever, they had a union for that, you know, playing in, musical instrument. If you were someone into farming or agriculture, they had a guild for that. They had a union for that. If you were into shipping uh, or maybe architecture or craftsmanship of some sort, they had a guild for that, a union for that. <clears throat> it was a blue-collar kind of town. And almost all of these union meetings, and this is important because it, it comes into play here in a minute, all of these union meetings and festivals and celebrations took place in the temple of Apollo. Now, this is something that you need to know. We read this, we've read this about three or four times already <clears throat> about sexual immorality and idolatry. That was addressed, we'll talk about this in a minute as well, in Acts chapter 15. That the, that the Jerusalem council, James, the brother of Jesus, and all of the other apostles came together and says, what must we share besides the gospel with the Gentile Christians? Because there's a sect of Jewish people who want them to become Jewish and have their faith. And, and so these people are coming out of a non-Jewish background do we really want them to be circumcised and observe the feast, so forth and so on? And here's what they said. That they re re refrain themselves from eating food that was still contaminated by its blood, to stay away from food sacrificed by idols, or to idols, and to abstain from sexual immorality. So those three things were to be addressed to the Gentiles as the gospel was being presented. So that's why these three things, or two things, keep coming up over and over again in these scriptures and in these uh, letters to the churches. Because those two things, idolatry, the worship of idols, and the eating the food, meaning the taking part in the uh, idolatrous uh, celebrations, and to include in those celebrations, as we've already talked to you about, temple prostitution and orgies, not to mention the fact that that sexual, human sexuality 
was put at the forefront of entertainment in Roman culture, and you see why it was the things that were consistently uh, addressed among all of, all of the churches. But those two things are highlighted, uh, not so that we just get hung up on those two things, but so those two things become to us symbolic of all of the temptations and all of the love affairs and of all of the idolatrous practices of our culture. It all centers around entertainment, sexuality, se uh, self-fulfillment, and so forth and so on. Greed, making money, on down the line. So, when we say those things, don't just think, well, you know, I, I don't have a problem with idolatry. We all do. I don't have a problem with sexual immorality. We all do. Uh, but, you know, you say, you say those, things don't, I, I, those things aren't pertaining to me. He said, listen, I'm talking to the churches. Now, if you're in a church, he's talking to you. And God doesn't waste his breath, all right? So he's, he's, he knows things. So let's get down to his symbol here. Number one, he introduces himself as the Son of God. The only time he addresses himself as the Son of God in any of the letters. Why? Because he's portraying to, uh, out of the image of chapter 1 that he gave to John, he's portraying to the church at Thyatira, uh, you need to know that the one that's talking to you is God himself. I'm, I'm the son of God and I have all authority. In other words, I'm the shot caller and you need to sit up and listen to what I have to say. All right? Because I'm going to talk about the good things that I see and then we're going to talk about the bad things that I see and we're not going to act like the good is good enough to overlook the bad. We're going to bring up the bad as well. He says that his eyes are as a flame of fire. Fire in the Bible speaks of judgment. He's saying, I'm looking at you with piercing, judgmental, all-knowing, all-seeing eyes. I see things about you. I see things about the church that you don't see or recognize. I see them, and I'm disclosing them, not so that I can hammer you, but so that you can repent, turn yourself back towards me, so that my church may become pure in the earth, so that her light shines the brightest, and that her salt retains its saltiness because the purpose of the church in the earth is to highlight, point to, propagate, preach, follow, adore, worship, and obey the King of kings and the Lord of lords. So that's why he's addressing this. And that's why he says his feet are like fine brass, emphasizing his holiness Impurity. So we don't think about these things when we think about church. We think everybody in church is good. Everybody outside of church needs help. First Peter 4.17 says otherwise. Let's look at it. For the time has come. This was written, okay, 2,000 plus years ago. For the time has come for judgment to, help me, begin. That means it's, it's not the consummation of, it's the starting point. For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, the people that he's loved and redeemed, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? And whether, In other words, if he's going to be uh, large and in charge and he's going to tend to business within his church, what do you think he's going to do to the people that have rejected grace, that have rejected mercy, that have rejected the gospel. What do you think that's going to be? Let me tell you what it's going to be. Bad. Amen. All right? So he is addressing his churches. Our current church culture today shuns the idea of a holy Christ judiciously judging, refining, and purifying his whole church. When we say God is good and God is great and God is good all the time and great all the time, we think in terms of what we think is good. But see, good means that it is accomplishing the purpose of God. And so God can do good things that aren't pleasant things. God can do good things that aren't fun things. Like me spanking my children or punishing them, that ain't fun, but that's good. Because that's helping them to become responsible adults because my job is to raise up kids who can be adults on their own. Not just any kind of adults, but God-fearing, Jesus-worshiping, Bible-believing, Spirit-filled, Gospel-sharing, responsible. 
serving people of God. Not takers, givers, not followers, leaders, not sorry, but having integrity. Those kind of people, and that's not an easy job. Then he says in point number two in verse 19, I know your works. And over and over again, he said this, I know your works. And he highlights them here. Love, service, faith, and patience. The four great essential qualities of the church. And if you were to walk up to the church at Thyatira and just walk around it and talk to the people, you'd say, man, that church has got everything you need. They have love. They have faith. They have perseverance. They have service. Man, I want to go to church there. And you would be half right. They did have the deeds of love that came from a genuine faith. They did have service that comes from a genuine faith. They did have love for God and for His Son, Jesus Christ. They did have works. They took their faith outside of the walls of the church and they loved on and administered to one another inside the walls. But look at 1 John three sixteen and 19. By this we know love. Because He laid down His life for us, we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And by this, we uh, know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. This church had true love, which manifests itself in works, particularly to those who are the, the least of these, the ones that are suffering. That's why I think it's a great opportunity, whether it be through the shoe boxes that we talked about earlier, or whether it be with the kids over here, or some of our kids that are over uh, across the street in the housing projects or in the, uh, or in the uh, trailer parks, that you and I would take the opportunity, as God gave, gives us opportunity and resources, as God gives us resources, and begin to surrender that, not hoard it, but to surrender it to see how we can help other people uh, elevate their status of living so that we can show other people that God, listen, guys, God wants you to prosper. Po, that's P-O, that's without the O-R. Po is not of God. Now, here's why I say that. Because God ain't Po. Po came into the world through sin, through death. Adam and Eve didn't like for anything. You say, Pastor Ann didn't have any clothes. Didn't need any clothes. Wouldn't you like to live in a world you didn't need any clothes? Hallelujah. What could you do with all the money you spend on nails? Clothes and haircuts. I mean, you see what I'm saying? All of that stuff. Is, so uh, th this is just our modern day leaf. This is, just, this is how we hide what we really are. If I can get my nails did, my hair did, and get my tan on, get my hem up, and get my chest out, my shoulders wide, then I can cover up that I'm broke, busted, and disgusted on the inside. So don't talk about my leaf, Randy. But nevertheless, all right. So, so he said, I know your works. And he said, you should be taking some of your resources, and instead of buying your fourth pair of pants, help somebody have their first. Instead of having your third house, help somebody find a, a bed to sleep in. You see what I'm saying? And so we should be manifesting that. And this church had that. So far, so good. But look at what he says. Look at what he says in verse 20. So far, it's so good. But he says, nevertheless. He goes, oh, snap. All good things must come to an end, right? Nevertheless means that he is about to disclose something that he's angry enough about that he will not let the good of what he has seen and what he knows to be true about the church so far cover it up. In other words, he said, you can't be so good inside the church that I'm not going to address what's wrong inside the church. Uh, you, we don't grade on a curve. If you've got 90% of it right, we're going to talk about the 10%. If you've got 97% of it right, we're going to address the 3%. Because God is holy. And because God is just. And while He's gracious, even here, where He gets to talking about Jezebel, here's what He said about Jezebel, who He says He's going to kill. I gave her time to repent. 
He didn't know her that. God doesn't owe you and me the time to repent. God doesn't owe us a favor. God doesn't owe us anything. Listen, the new covenant, just FYI, go read the book of Galatians. The new covenant is not between you and God. The new covenant is between God the Father and God the Son. When Abraham was grafted into the covenant, God put him to sleep. And Jesus Christ walked the blood pathway. And God crucified him. And God made a covenant with Abraham and his seed. Big S. God has an agreement with his son. You and I become partakers and benefactors of that covenant by faith through grace, by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. God didn't cut a deal with you. God cut a deal with Jesus and cut you in on the deal if you'll receive Jesus. But without Jesus, you ain't in on the deal. He said, you allow that woman Jezebel. Now, if you've got a pen, it ain't sacrilegious to write in your Bible. You need to circle that word allow. You need to star it because that was the sin of the church. It's called in today's terms, wait for it, tolerance. Tolerance is a perverted, worldly distortion of the biblical word love. He says, you got a woman. I'm not sexist. I'm not a bigot. I, 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 I'm old-fashioned. I hold the door. I, I believe that women, uh, you know, uh, have the right, their rightful place assigned by God, and men should love their wives like Christ loved the church. But here's what he said. You got a woman. Now, her name wasn't Jezebel. Jezebel, remember that this book is a book of signs and symbols so that he can communicate truth to the churches without Rome getting in on the deal. So all of these churches know church history. And they know about Jezebel, the pagan granddaughter of the king uh, Ethbal, who worshipped Baal and who was herself a pagan idolatrous woman who Ahab, king of the northern king of Israel, married for political expediency. And she came in the house and she began to manipulate him. And she introduced through him idolatry and sexual immorality that was practiced in the worship of Baal. She brought it into the kingdom. She brought it into Israel. Through the leadership, the spirit of Jezebel is a manipulative, sexual, amorous, uh, it's big, uh, look it up. I, I, I don't want to, we got the kids in here today. Um, it's the spirit of promiscuity, it's the spirit of worldliness, it's a, spiritual, a spirit of corruption, of manipulation, of getting their ways by being in their way. Matter of fact, she came in one day, and this is going back to 1 Kings chapter 16, and she walked in one day and she said, Ahab, what's wrong with you? Y'all sad in the face. This is Randy's rendition of it. Right? Y'all sad in the face. He said, well, I wanted to buy Nabal's vineyard, and he wouldn't sell it to me. She said, you've got to be kidding me. You're the king. You ask him to sell it to you? Why didn't you just take it? He goes, well, it belongs to him, and I don't need it. You know, you know, you know. He was just crawl fishing. He's a sissified man. And she said, don't you worry about it, baby. You just sit down there and kick your feet up a little bit. And you know what she did? She conspired, got some people, lied on Naboth, murdered the man and took his vineyard. And said, there it is, baby. Happy Father's Day. You the man. So he just fell down all over her feet like a slobbering, bumbling idiot. And she just ran roughshod over him by winking and hiking her skirt up and talking sweet things and nothing. And she corrupted him and, led, and through him corrupted the nation of Israel, and God said, I'm going to punish Israel for it. And that spirit was in this woman, in this church, who was being tolerated. Now, here's probably the situation. It's not written, but I just take two and two, come, come up close to four. She's probably the preacher's wife. Beth, I'm not calling you. 
You are Jezebel, not Jezebel, all right? <laughs> the reason she's being tolerated is because, obviously, she's in a position of influence. Would you agree? All right, you don't let some low-tiered woman get over there and run Russia. Obviously, she's exercised some level of influence, has some level of following, has some level of allegiance, and probably is considered to be hands-off because of some other person. And she is wielding her immoral, ungodly influence on others in the church. And it says that she led them into adultery, which means both literal and spiritual. The Bible calls adultery in the spiritual realm to worship someone or something other than God himself. When you and I pledge our allegiance to God, i.e. get saved and born again, we make him, declare him to be the King of kings and the Lord of lords. When we dethrone him, not by just saying, I dethrone you because we would never do that, but simply by going and worshiping other things in place of God, which means that we place other things in a higher priority than God, in a higher priority than the things of God. Y'all know, I'm, y'all know where I was going to go with that, right? When you prioritize things above God, You and I are committing spiritual adultery. Which will eventually find itself in spiritual immorality. That is, shacking up and backing up with all the wrong people. It just happened. You see, I don't care what you say. I don't care what I say. It really doesn't matter what anybody says. Here's what happens. You... You sleep with what you love. Can we just put it that way? You sleep with what you love. And when we love with the world, we sleep with the world. And we wake up and we got the world all over. And y'all know what I'm talking about because I've done it with y'all and y'all have done it with me. Don't look at me all cockeyed. Y'all know what it's like, right? To have the stench of the world about you. I remember, I remember going to church because I was brought up right. And I could party as hardy as anybody else wanted to party hardy. But I was going to go to church. I was, play, I was the quintessential religious hypocrite. And while all the people that I partied with on Saturday night stayed home and in bed, because that's where they wanted to be, I went to church. That's where I wanted to be, but not so bad that I would sacrifice for it. But I said, I remember sitting, coming to church and sitting on the back row and trying my best not to breathe deeply because you can't wash the smell of scotch off your breath. And you can't take the smell of it out of your skin. And I knew that people would look and go, my God, boy, did you just walk out of the club? Yes, I did. And that stench of the world, I use that as an illustration to say the stench of the world had been brought into the church by the, by the deceptive teachings of Jezebel. How, how did it happen? I mean, how does that happen? She probably said, hey guys, listen. People are probably saying, well, you know, with Jezebel, you know, we, we, we came out of the gills and you know, we got saved, uh, but it, it was it virtually, you look back in history and they'll tell you, it was almost impossible like it is today. It was almost impossible if you were a skilled craftsman or a laborer to get, a, to get work if you weren't in the union. If you were in the union, you had to go to the union meetings. Does this sound familiar with anybody? Well, you know what they did at the union meetings? They started off with the worship of Apollo dedicated the meal to Apollo, ate the meal that was dedicated to Apollo, and then topped it off with business, and then after that was pleasure. So she probably, and they probably came to her in some sort of crazy teaching that they had. So they said, look, what do we, you know, what do we do? I can't get work. I, I can't, I can't, you know, I love Jesus, but I got to feed my family. She said, listen, 
man got to do what a man's got to do. Y'all heard that? Got to feed your family. Got to, got to, nobody thought to start their own union of non-union employees. Nobody thought about that, right? How about we unionize all the scabs? For those people that have been in the union, a scab is a person that was in the union and got out. Why don't we just start a scab union? Nobody thought about that. She said, just go do, which means that these men were leaving home, going to the union meetings, dedicating a meal to the idol, eating it, talking a little bit about business, and then sleeping with temple prostitutes and then coming home. Now, you imagine how that went over. And that's in the church. But nobody would stop it. Nobody would speak up about it. So I wrote down a couple of things here, and we're going to write, we're going to finish up with this. How does this happen? Let's go to Mark 9.42. Now, this is the teaching of the kingdom of heaven. These are... These, this is in the foundational teachings of understanding about the kingdom of heaven. I want you to read this. But whoever causes one of these little ones to stumble, who believe, who, little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. Now, y'all know who said that? Yeah, Jesus. Jesus talking about tying a millstone around somebody's neck. That's, that's strong. And this is what Jezebel was doing. And this is why God came down. This is why Jesus came down on this church hard. Because they were tolerating someone, Jezebel, who was causing, he said it right here, my servants, his little ones, who believe in me to stumble in their faith. By telling them to do those things. Oh God, don't get me started. To do those things that violate your conscience so that you can feed your family. And it's in the church today. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Say, Pastor, don't get political. It's all political. Jesus is a king. It starts political. And he's Lord of Lords. It ends political. <laughs> Snap, crackle, and pop. How does this happen in the church? One, it's the desire of the church to fit in with the culture. We like to belong. We like to be considered relevant. We are seduced. That's what it said. Who seduces? We are seduced into this by believing the lie that the church and her fundamental traditions and teachings have become irrelevant in the current culture. Pastor Randy, we don't have any room for this. We don't have any room for that. That's old school. We don't do that anymore. That, that's, that went out, you know, and that, that doesn't have... That, that, we, you've got to do something to reach the kids, which what you're saying is we've got to become more like the world so our worldly children will come and hang out with us. I'm not just talking about the, the kids. I'm talking about everybody. We grow up in a culture now that is known as a postmodern culture. What is postmodernism? You don't know what it is. I didn't know what it is until I started, you know, studying the Bible and history and all of that. But here's what postmodernism is, and it's inside the Church of Jesus Christ because it abides in the world around us, and the world has come inside the church. Postmodernism is the belief that we can't really know anything for sure. That means that there's really no absolutes. There's really no moral absolutes. That everything is relative. That everything is judged on an individual case, on an individual basis, determining whether or not it's right for this particular situation. We call it situational ethics. We call it moral relativism. We call it fitting in. We call it relevancy. But all it is is saying that there is no absolute truth. And that if you really believe something, then it's true for you. And that if it's true for you, I must believe what is true for you is true for you. And I must go along with it. I must tolerate it. I have to tolerate in this world today, if you are a male, born male, birth certificate, male, physically 
male. I have to, I have to tolerate your subjective truths that are relevant based on any given situation that you're a girl. And I have to agree with you so I don't want to offend you. That's called tolerance. That's what was going on in the church. And, and, and which, which is basically stupidity. But watch this now. That here's, what, here's how I wrote it. It's the belief that all must tolerate all. I've got to read this so I don't mess it up. The Lord gave this to me. And that if you can't allow me to believe what I want to believe, even though the Bible strictly forbids or teaches against it, then you, my friend, are a bigot, a homophobe, a xenophobe. Y'all know what a xenophobe is? People that are prejudiced against foreigners. You're a racist and you are intolerant. Which means that the world is willing to be tolerant of the world, but intolerant of Christians who don't tolerate their stupidity. But instead of them being the bad guys because truth is on our side, they've skewed truth, skewed love, redefined it, and now the good guys are the bad guys, and the bad guys are the good guys, and what used to be right is now wrong, and what used to be wrong is now right, because everybody up in the house is, ro is running through life based on their feelings instead of truth. Number two, it's the failure to rightly define sin. In our efforts to fit in with the culture and to remain culturally relevant so that the world doesn't come and burn down our church or throw us into jail and so that our friends will still let us play cards with them on Thursday night and come to the country club with them on Saturday and go to the football game on Saturday night. We no longer call sin what it is. But in the Bible, sin is lawlessness. It's rebellion. It's spiritual adultery. It's spiritual treason. But we dare not whisper these words, much less speak them out in our bigger circles of fellowship outside the church and within our smaller circles of fellowship inside the church. We drop those words called lawlessness, rebellion, and sin and substitute them with words like struggles, issues, diseases, disorders. An addiction. No longer are you an alcoholic bound by sin, but you have a disease that you can't get over. See how that works? That's okay, brother. Something you just can't get over. You was, you was born with that disease, and it's just, it's just, it just is what it is. I mean, so you know. Tolerant, according to the old definition in the Webster's Dictionary, it says, I, it says this, I may disagree with you, but I insist upon your right to your opinion, no matter how stupid I think it is. That's tolerant. Now, I looked this up. I'm not this smart. I, don't, I didn't know this just in passing. I had to look this up. But did you know that they, in 1995, the United Nations, in a declaration of tolerance. That's what it's called, the Declaration of Tolerance. Redefine the word. So help me God. Here's what the new definition says. It is the rejection of all dogmatism and absolutism. Reworded in other words, it means there are no absolute truths and all opinions are equal and all opinions are relevant except for the ones that disagree with our opinions. In other words, you can have your opinion, but if my opinion of your opinion is negative, I'm not entitled to my opinion. I'm, I'm now intolerant. I'm not walking in love. How many times did I hear that during COVID? You're not walking in love. No, I'm telling the truth. As Archie told Edith, 
I'm speaking to you in English and you're listening to me in dingbat. <laughs> All right. Number three, or C, the way we fall for it is we forsake all truth for relativism. Get this. In May of 2020, the Barna Research Group polled Christians who identified as evangelical Christians. 72%. I, I, I still, that's a high number, but I still don't grasp it. They call themselves evangelical Christians, but only 72% of them believe that God is the source of truth. How in the name of Jesus can you believe that God is God and not the source of all truth? We are messed up. But it gets even better than that. By better, I mean more stupid. Listen. Despite 72% of evangelicals believing that God is the source of absolute truth, 46% of them reject the idea that there is absolute truth. Most adults in the world, saved or unsaved, believe that truth is relative, meaning that it only pertains to the person and the situation at hand. Nearly two thirds. This is this is this is going to this 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 is going. Nearly two thirds of teenagers, when asked about absolute truth, say that they they discern truth subjectively, meaning by their emotions, their feelings, or the opinions of others. Two thirds of our teenagers today. Decide whether or not something is true at the moment based on how they feel or what everybody else said because they don't want to be excluded. Well, if you take control of the narrative, if you take control of the conversation, if you shout it from the rooftops long enough, hard enough, and loud enough, you can tell a lie and they'll believe it's the truth because they don't want to be intolerant of other people because they want to walk in love. Hence, America today. Hence, America today. We have failed to stand for the truth. Now, I'm going to go through a series of scriptures here, and I want you to see that God was pretty dogmatic, and God was pretty absolute when it came to truth, the gospel, and Jesus. Let's just begin with 1 Timothy 6.20. We'll put up here. Oh, Timothy... Guard what was committed to your trust. Avoid the profane and idle babblings and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. All right, let's go to Jude 3 and 4. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation. He's talking about the gospel here. I found it necessary to write to you exhorting you to contend earnestly. That's, that's called fighting. To contend earnestly for the faith. Not your faith. Not their faith. Not some subjective faith. But the faith. T-H-E faith. There is one Lord. One faith. One baptism. One mediator between God and man. The Lord Jesus Christ. He said, I want you to contend for the faith which was once for all delivered to all the saints. In other words, I ain't telling you to guard something you don't know about. I'm telling you to guard what was given to you by which at one time you declared allegiance and staked your life on it. For certain men and women have crept in unnoticed. Well, how do you not notice this? Because they walk like a duck. And they talk like a duck. And they quack like a duck. But they're not a duck. Who long ago were marked out for this condemnation. Ungodly men. Now here comes tolerance. Who turn the grace of our God into lewdness. And deny the only Lord God our Lord 
Jesus Christ. And when he said crept in, unnoticed, that means crept in to the crowd of believers. Crept into the church. Got in the circle. Got elected by a pulpit committee that 95% of them were lost. Running the church like a business instead of like a family and a church. Playing politics. Got an interview for a job. I thought you were called. Ain't interviewing for a job. Show me, dear God, in the in the book where people interviewed for a job of preaching the gospel. Stupid. All right. I like that word. That's why I use it. Second Timothy two one. You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace. That is in Christ Jesus. How do you be strong in the grace? You grow in it. You grow in it. You work it. You you understand it. You learn that the grace of uh, the Lord Jesus Christ is a transforming grace. It's a segregating grace. Meaning that it, it calls us out of the world. It calls us not to... Even though we are in the world, we are not of the world. We don't live like the world. We don't make decisions like the world. Our priorities are opposite of the world. We, we, we follow a different king and we abide in a different kingdom and our values and our principles and the truth of God is absolute in our life. Yes. 2 Timothy 1, 8 through 11. Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel. Guys, why do we always talk about sufferings for the gospel? You say, Pastor, I never really understood that because I've never really suffered for the gospel. Well, two things. Number one is you live in a protected culture that's guarded by that flag and that flag. But the farther we get away from that flag, the more that flag is going to crumble and the more you're going to suffer. The further you get away from the cross, the further you get away from Christ, the further you get away from the truth, which formed this flag, one nation under God, once you come out from under God, no longer are you indivisible, but you're divisible. No longer do you have truth, I mean, liberty for all. You have intolerance for all. You cannot have that flag without that flag. For we determined that these truths are self-evident. Self-evident. That all men were created equal and were endowed by their Creator with certain inalienable rights, among which, and you know the rest of it, because that flag is built on the foundation of that flag, but the Scripture tells us if the foundations be destroyed, what will the righteous do? Okay. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me as prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings of the gospel. Because when you and I stand up for truth, we're going to suffer. According to the power of God, who has saved us, oh, snap, here you go, he's going to get hairy now, who has saved us, ain't a period, and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which he was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. Next verse. But has now been revealed. By the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel to which this is how you find a preacher. I was appointed a preacher, an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. Wasn't elected a preacher. He was appointed. Wasn't elected an apostle. He was appointed. Wasn't elected as a teacher. He was appointed. Appointed by God and people saw the calling of God on his life and appointed his appointment. Acknowledge his anointing and said, we need you. Get in the pulpit. All right, so now, look at verse 13 and 14. Hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. The good thing which was committed to you, that's the gospel, keep by the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. We've got uh, two more. 2 Timothy 2, 15 through 19. Do you have that one? Be diligent to present yourself approved to God. A worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of... Guys, look at me. There's no such thing as a partial truth. If it's not 100% true, it ain't true. You don't have kind of truth. 
partial truth. And here's something else you need to know. If it's ever been true, it's always been true. Amen. Truth never changes. Truth is eternal. A worker did not need to be ashamed. Right to divide the word of truth. But shun, shun. Well, y'all, show me how you shun something. Jezebel. Y'all, you know, talk to the hand. Jezebel. But, but, Pastor. Get out the door. Church discipline. Je- Jezebel. Got a letter from God about you. Got some Holy Ghost boldness to say, but we ain't going to take the fall for you. We're not going pun- to suffer punishment because of your stupidity. Hit the dough. Exit the floor. Get out. In the name of Jesus. Watch this now. But shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness. And their message will spread like a cancer. Hymenaeus and Philetus are of this sort who have strayed concerning the faith, saying that the resurrection is already past. And through teaching that, they overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands having this seal. The Lord knows those who are His. And let everyone who names the name of Christ Depart from issues. Depart from diseases. Depart from hang-ups. Depart from iniquity. Let everyone who names the name... And that's what Jesus Christ wrote this letter to Thyatira. You call yourself by my name, depart from iniquity. Put it apart from you. Last one, 2 Timothy 4, 2 and 4. (laughs) <laughs> last one we're getting ready to go home but avoid oh preach the word preach the word preach the word how many of y'all ever watched a bible uh, a, a, a preaching service and the man never break out a bible I watched I watched an hour and a half of a revival man never cracked a bible now you say Pastor Ann why did you watch it that long because I wanted to see how far stupid was going to go You know what he preached on? His dreams and his visions and encounters with angels. You see, people, it says, this Jezebel, she called herself, oh, thank you, Jesus, for not letting me forget this. She calls herself a prophetess. And then he goes down and it says, talking about the, her doctrine was called the the depths of Satan. Jesus has a little bit of a humor there. It was a, it was a, he would, it wasn't the depths of Satan. They, they thought, they thought it was knowledge. They thought that they knew something that everybody else didn't know which is the basis for Gnosticism. Look it up, do your church history study. Gnosticism means that there's some truth that can be known, but everybody can't know it. Certain people get to know it, and then they let you in on it. I'm telling you, it's in the book. So Jezebel calls herself a prophetess. You know what she was doing? She was probably telling them her dreams and visions and was usurping the authority of God's word with her emotional dreams, not knowing that it was a sweet potato pie that made her have that stupid dream <clears throat> of leaving her husband for another preacher and doing the Lord's work. It's a sin. God didn't send that dream, you knucklehead. Know your word. Watch this. <clears throat> for the time will come, and it's here. Not coming here. When they, who is they? The people inside the church will not endure sound teaching. That's what doctrine means, teaching. But according to their own desires. Now you're talking about Jezebel. According to their own desires because they have itching ears, meaning that they've been wanting to do it for a long time. They're just looking for a Bible reason. They're just looking for a prophet to tell me something I don't know. They will heap up for themselves teachers. Oh, there she is. That's how she got in there. They went and found her. And they will turn their ears away from the truth. From the truth. And be turned aside to faith. I believe the church. I'm going to read this and I'm, I'm, read, I'm going to read this and I'm, we're going to be done. I believe 
that the church is in danger from having tolerated a bunch of ridiculous beliefs and doctrines. That we have entertained everyone else's opinion about things to the neglect of God's word. I believe we, like Thyatira, have been seduced by the godless perversion of the definition of love and grace. We've become too afraid and too loving and too tolerant to speak the truth because we are afraid of losing the argument, of losing our friends, of losing our acceptance, of losing our jobs, of losing our life. And in doing so, we have simply allowed Jezebel to become rooted and grounded and almost immovable inside the church. To quote the great, late, great Martin Luther King, quote, there comes a time when silence is betrayal. Our lives begin to end the day we become silent about the things that matter. We are living in the days when Jezebel is being tolerated. And God said, you better get away from her because I'm going to put her in a sick bed. I'm going to kill her children, that is her followers, who commit adultery with her. I'm going to kill them and put them in great tribulation so that all the churches will know that I'm the one who judges the hearts and minds. In other words, here's what he says. I'm going to punish them in public and openly so that everybody knows I know what's going on inside my church. We stand to our feet. To those that overcome, we will get to rule with Christ over the nations. Our time is coming. He said to those who do not partake of this particular doctrine, hold fast what you have until I come. Hold fast what you have until I come. Earnestly contend for the gospel. <clears throat> While they are getting ready, I want, to t I want to be completely honest with you guys. I need you to know something. Not so that you can come up and pat me on the back and say I think you're right. And not so that some of you can come up and confront me face to face and say I think you were wrong. Not so that some of you can say, come up to me and say, I, I, I'm glad you said that this morning. And not so that some of you can come up and say, I don't think you should have said that this morning. Let us just be perfectly clear. What I'm getting ready to tell you is my personal conviction based on the truth of God's word. What this flag stands for and how that flag gave that flag which gave me the rights. I don't care. I personally could care less if any of you have been vaccinated or unvaccinated. That is not my horse to ride. I care 100% and I will stand against any law, edict, ruling, or anything else that they call it, that comes down from the leadership of our country that mandates that I have to stick something in my arm that violates my conscience, has its own risk, and will have to do so to my children in order to be able to make a living for my kids, in order to be able to retire from my job. In order, to be, in order to see a doctor personally, in order to be insurable, in order to be to go in public places, I need you to know today that I do not, and I never will, ever concede to that kind of law. Amen. And I am good, listen to me, and I am good with wherever God takes that. I have a lot. I live in comfort. And I'm debt free. But I am willing to give it all away. To be homeless and hungry and beg on your doorstop. But I will not allow the unfortunate, untimely, and hard deaths of 753,000 people to usurp the freedom that 3 million men and women bled and died of their own free will to give me the choice to make those decisions. You will not shame me into taking it. You will not talk me into taking it. 
You can't run me off. You can't break me down. You can't buy me out. I am not for sale. And on this rock, I make my stand.